Hi everyone, my name is Ali and I'm excited today to present to you my talk entitled Toward Inclusifying the Underrepresented Minority in STEM Education Research. So to begin my talk, I want to start with this quote from the former U.S. Census Director Kenneth Pruitt, in which he states, Not in recorded history has there been a nation so demographically complex. So it falls to us, the American citizens of the 21st century, to fashion from this diversity history's first world nation. One of the critical parts of this quote that I want to really emphasize is the fact that we as citizens of the United States are part of a demographically complex society. And part of that de demographic complexity is the fact that our students come from a demographically complex set of backgrounds and lived experiences. What I wanna focus on within that complexity is the term underrepresented minority or URM and try to unpack just how complex that term is and how we might need to now critique that term in a way that better reflects our students and their very lived experiences and the diversity of life that they come from. So in order to do that, I think we're going to focus on three main questions to try to unpack that term underrepresented minority or URM. Those three questions are listed here. What are the problems with URM? Why do we need to quote unquote, inclusify URM, a term I'll explain later, and how can we inclusify URM through actual steps of improving our demographic data collection practices? So to get into that first question, what are the problems with URM? You may have used this term before, your research might involve this term, it might be something you're measuring, you're asking students whether or not they fall into the URM category, and this is you know, a, a widespread practice within the undergraduate STEM education research. But what I want to really emphasize to begin with are the fact that there, there are definitely problems with URM from other scholars that have understood why URM might ne not necessarily be the best term in the world. So first and foremost, there's an association of diversity with racial heterogeneity, meaning that just because you have many different, let's say, races, you are officially diverse. There's, a, there's great diversity. Uh, that association is rather one dimensional and that's supported by scholarly work by Lemon and Tienda. Additionally, the URM label has been so far as, you know, critiqued as a tool of oppression even, degrading and dehumanizing by other scholars. And importantly, the URM label, it undermines the expansive, what's called within group diversity that exists within the entire URM spectrum. So for example, the Latinx population or the Latin population has many, many subpopulations within it that are themselves very, very diverse, but are looped into this large aggregate monolithic URM category. And what I wanna emphasize is that the term URM or underrepresented minority, it's not alone. There are many other terms that you might have seen or used that have more or less aggregation of folks uh, and other terms, perhaps all the labels that we have have issues. What I've tried to do in the, the reference that I'll show at the end is actually summarize what's available out there. These are some of the terms that I've come across. These terms are ranging in their level of aggregation from more aggregated to less aggregated, um, from more inclusive to less inclusive. They're all out there and these terms exist. And I don't think it's our job today, at least within the time that we have to figure out what's the best term to use then. What our job today is to critique the terms that are out there and really be a little more critical of the term that we do use and why we use it and how we use it instead of just using the term haphazardly. And that's what I tried to do with this table of showing you that there's a great complexity of the measurement that we're trying to do and there might be a way hopefully to now inclusify it. And that's what I mean by moving on to this term inclusify. Why do we need to inclusify URM? When I say inclusify here, it sort of is a made up term, but it comes from uh, work by Johnson here in which we're going to continuously try to make something more inclusive. You might have heard of the term diversify. We need to diversify STEM. We need to diversify our classrooms. We need to diversify our universities. That's just step one, in my opinion. We also need to inclusify. We need to make these spaces inclusive. And one of the things that we have to be really careful of is just assuming that when we have diversity, more URMs, we're good to go. That's not the case. We need to inclusify the usage of the term before we even go into any other points of advancing the term or the research. And in order to do that, I think we have to keep 
something very clear from a theoretical basis that diversity and inclusion are not the same. And without inclusion, we may unintentionally actually compromise our efforts to promote diversity within STEM education. And again, some references there to help emphasize the need for that. Additionally, from a theoretical basis, when we're trying to inclusify, what we also have to recognize, and this is really critical here, this work comes from critical theorists, too often educators equate culture with race and ethnicity and make assumptions about students' cultural practices based solely or primarily on the student's membership in a particular racial or ethnic group. I think that's a dangerous route to take. If we assume that just based off of the static, socially constructed nature of race and ethnicity, that we're sort of you know, monolithically looking at an entire culture, let's say the Latin culture, uh, let's say the Asian subculture, there are dangers to that. There are dangers to assuming all of this widespread, monolithic, aggregated understanding of culture with a simple sort of socially constructed category of race and ethnicity. So we need to change that. We need to do better. If we want to advance the efforts within STEM education, we have to, quote unquote, inclusify our usage of the term URM. One of the main reasons I think we should do this actually comes from a response that I got when I uh, posted my paper, the, the, the one that I'll reference at the end, uh, about this idea of inclusifying URM. I have this reflection in there. I'll read it. This personal reflection makes me think about others who would fall into the same predicament like the Syrian refugee student who ends up selecting white, or the Rohingya refugee student who selects Asian, both of whom under our current system would be terribly miscategorized as both overrepresented and part of a majority. How dangerous could that be to the overall outcomes that we're trying to improve? And never did this become more clear to me that when I posted this on LinkedIn, a person I didn't know, Muhammad here, he commented, he found this somehow, some way, and he commented, I am a Rohingya refugee from the world's largest refugee camp in Bangladesh. I'm thankful to you about your writing. I'm a hungry for education. Never did I see that it's more clear that we need to do this, that we need to improve the way that we're looking at this term URM and we're trying to collect our demographic data. So how can we possibly do this? We don't have nearly enough time to go over all of the nuances and details, but here are some ideas that I go over in the paper that I'll briefly mention here. First and foremost, let's redefine URM. Other scholars have done this. Other scholars have inclusified it, have expanded the definition, have made the definition a little bit more critical. And if we're not going to you know, sort of choose a, a term, let's instead of just redefining it, be very clear when we say URM, what we mean by it, why we're using it, what are the affordances, what are the nuances that are being assumed when we're using this term, sort of like a, a warning label, if you will. Additionally, we can go through data disaggregation practices in which in our demographic data collection, instead of just asking for monolithic subcultures or sub racial categories, trying to disaggregate those a little bit further. When we say quote unquote Asian, we have dozens of subpopulations that exist that are being looped into one monolithic category. And I think that's dangerous and I think that's not good. And also we can use multiple demographic data points, uh, more than just race, uh, race and ethnicity, that could help inform our understanding of who we want to improve outcomes for and why we want to improve those outcomes. I think a great model for change is represented by the, American, the Association of American Medical Colleges, in which they go through a couple of different steps. We don't have the time to actually unpack each of those steps, but I do explain that in the paper in a little bit more detail. So that's how we can possibly do this, how we can possibly inclusify the URM term. One thing I'd like you to do in sort of the minute that I have remaining in the actual talk portion here is utilize the chat. Um, write one action step. I want us to be critical here. Do something here that you will take. I know many of us have a demographic data point that we collect. We ask students something about their demographics. How will you make that step more inclusive? How might you criticize yourself or go through a self-critique of trying to make that more inclusive to represent some of the things I've been talking about. Take a few moments to think about that. Take a few moments to think about the surveys you give out, about the you know instrument that you use, and think about how you can make that demographic data collection a little bit more inclusive. In the next 30 seconds or so, please, please feel free to type your answers in the chat. And I recognize that's a lot to ask in 30 seconds. If not, uh, you can also just write one reflection you have, hopefully, uh, about the URM term, something new you might have learned uh, over the next 30 to 40 seconds. Uh, and I'll be looking at the chat.
Nice, I see prefer to self-describe. I think that's a great option. Yeah, leave it open-ended. Um, ask them about something they'd like me to know. So it's on their terms, absolutely. And for students of choose agent, I'd like to have a write-in category. Perhaps this would be useful for all. I agree, I agree. Awesome. Uh, I don't have the time to go over uh, everything here, but I'm really, really excited. And hopefully I can collect all of this and try to do this myself as well uh, as we move forward. Um, so sort of to just round out this talk now, uh, I want to give you three questions that we started with and the three takeaways I hope you have. What are the problems with URM? Hopefully now you can critique the URM term, be a little bit more critical about that term. Why do we need to inclusify URM? Hopefully you know what it means now to inclusify URM and justify the need for change. And then how can we do it? You've all listed some fantastic action steps within the chat. I encourage you to use that as a piece of self-reflection uh, self and continue to do that as you start to improve, hopefully, uh, and, and make your data collection practices a little bit more inclusive. I end with this following quote. It comes from the landmark case and the affirmative action case from 1977, where it's stated by Justice Powell that the diversity that further that that uh, the diversity that furthers a compelling state interest encompasses a far broader array of qualifications and characteristics of which racial and ethnic origin is but a single though important element. And I think that's where we can again broaden our scope when it comes to our demographic data collection practices. Uh, I end with uh, the reference here. I explain in much greater detail within the full publication. Hopefully you've uh, gotten at least enough understanding through the talk uh, and I'm happy to answer questions now uh, and look through the chat with any other feedback that you have. Thank you. Hello everyone. So thank you Ali for your presentation. Um, you also have the attachments available to you in the um, the set up attachments, his paper, as well as the presentation, if you wanted to see that. So the first question you have is, okay, so all groups are arbitrary or artificial, but with too many subgroups, data analysis becomes hard. How do we balance? Yeah, I think that's the the one of the super important parts of this is that there's a reality to our research in which when we don't have enough data being aggregated, we don't have enough statistical power, uh, and then that could limit our understanding or our presentation of the data. Um, this is an open question. I don't know the answer. Uh, it's a, I think it's a balancing act. I think if there's a point at which you have to, you know, collect data in a way where it's aggregated, do it, but then explain the nuance of that, explain and justify the reasoning for that, justify that you need the statistical power there, and that you recognize the affordance of the possible aggregation of subgroups that may or may not be well represented here, uh, and then maybe unpack that within you know a qualitative part of your paper, within uh, some of the you know discussion section of your paper of like how you can possibly improve this and get more data points to hopefully increase that statistical power. It's a balancing act. All right, thank you. Next question. I'm curious about your thoughts about disaggregation versus sample size. Many authors aggregate to these large groups. Um, in parentheses, Asian due to statistical limitations, which has been positioned as white logic, maybe a related topic. What do you recommend we do when we're pursuing quantitative research? Yeah, I myself come from a quantitative background and I, I struggle with this myself. Uh, I think the biggest recommendation that I have uh, is to sort of, again, explain the nuance in the writing. We have an opportunity to write within our papers, right? We have an opportunity to explain. So, so you know, sort of have a, a warning label, if you will, uh, of take this with a grain of salt and understand the limitations of the aggregation that I did here uh, and recognize that hopefully the practice can be more inclusive with future data collection. All right, I think there's a there's one in the chat that looks like a statement, but it became a question on the end of it, so I'll read it. It says, I struggle with write-in and open-ended reporting in my research. It's probably more inclusive on the student side of things, but it might mean more might mean those students get left out of my data analysis. Any suggestions? Yeah, I think it, again, just comes down to figuring out where specifically being strategic about where you really think that open-ended question will yield the most uh, sort of inclusive feedback, most inclusive responses. Uh, and then from there, utilizing that as a jumping point to then perhaps inform the large scale aggregate analysis that you need to do, starting from the inclusive, inclusive side of things. And then from there, going into more of the aggregated data collection that we know is necessary for statistical power. Sounds 